Okay, hello, welcome um, to Marketing Communications, uh, actually Marketing Fundamentals um, here at MidState. Um, my name is Andrew Palios. Um, I'm the instructor uh, for this class. I've taught this class um, online um, once or twice in the past. Um, one time it was a hybrid class. Um, the difference being that everyone is present, uh, usually with their cameras off during the lectures. Um, whereas the fully online course, so a lot of you might already know that you, you maybe have taken an online course before, um, that a, a video will come out weekly um, of, of me um, giving out the lecture and then providing uh, you the content and the direction um, uh, as far as uh, what we'll be uh, working on and what is going to be necessary for some of the assignments. Um, so let me get rid of some of my um, work stuff here. I actually work at MidState. Um, I work here as a, uh, a senior creative graphic and digital uh, media specialist. Um, so in so many words, this was a, a role that I recently took on where I do a lot of the creative work from the print marketing stuff and all the digital marketing stuff. I manage um, uh, the, the MidState Facebook page um, do a lot of copywriting. I'm basically the voice behind all of the posts. Um, do a lot of art direction, a lot of the branding artwork, so the um, the Photoshop work, the photography, um, just anything you can think of that uh, from a marketing standpoint I work on in the um, organization. I report to the director of marketing there. I mean, we work closely to build out campaigns and things um, like that. Um, in my past, um, I'll stop sharing my screen since I'm just kind of talking. Um, in my past, um, I've uh, worked in the print industry. I've uh, for about four years at Quad Graphics, which is a um, uh, which is like the second uh, largest uh, printing company um, in the uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, there, I did a lot of uh, digital marketing, um, but I also um, uh, learned a lot about the printing process as well. The products that I was involved in helping sell through my digital marketing and my graphic design work um, uh, actually were installed and sold to printers and printed on printing presses to measure color and things like that. So um, if you can imagine um, a McDonald's, like a printing company that prints things from McDonald's will want to make sure that the McDonald's um, uh, packaging is the same yellow and the same red, um, whether it be you know, sold in the United States or sold in China, you know, or Japan or any other country in Europe, um, that even if the food is not consistent, the packaging is definitely consistent. And one printer in Japan, China will need to print the same red as the printer here in the United States. So um, there are products out there that are sold to printing companies that produce um, uh, this packaging to make sure that the color is accurate across the board for those different uh, um, applications. Um, you know, before that, I was at a, like an advertising agency where I did like graphic design work, basically just doing creative work um, and, and things like that. Um, uh, I also worked at a print company too, where I was producing content, um, uh, basically working as the printer. Um, so I was uh, producing work for printers, so, uh, for machines. So if a graphic designer would give me something or give the company something, I would come in and optimize the um, artwork to make sure that it could run on a different kind of a press. So, um, you know, differences between RGB color and CMYK color are things that I will, you know, familiarize myself with and convert images over to make sure that they are printable uh, from one medium to the other. Um, and most recently, I got into um, my position prior to this. I worked at a, a nonprofit agency. Uh, so I like to kind of jump around in different types of industries and see where, um, uh, you know, kind of experience how does a marketer operate in these different types of industries. Um, and so that led me to, you know, education uh, prior to this, uh, to this uh, organization, MidState. Um, like I said, I worked at a, a nonprofit where um, we were actually hosting an annual conference where I was uh, designing like signage and marketing campaigns to um, get um, 
uh, pharmaceutical industry representatives to come and exhibit at our conference that we hosted them. So um, we were marketing to companies like Pfizer or Moderna or these different drug companies to have them come to exhibit at our um, conference. And so um, I was involved in creating the marketing stuff, but also signage for the conference itself and the environmental graphics and things like that which are of course printed, but there's also the digital component too to market and direct mail, emails and things like that, website uh, designs, landing pages, um, text messages, um, uh, conference apps, stuff like that. So there was, those were things that I was kind of managing. Now here at MidState, um, you know, I don't, I don't do a lot of the stuff I used to do, but I do, I still do a lot of the stuff that I used to do at just a more, um, you know, in a different in a different industry, um, the education industry. I'm very interested in. I've I've been in this industry for like the past eight years. Um, I think part time as an instructor for a while, and then here amidst uh, um, at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. Now that institution is more focused on the artwork, uh, the visual design aspect. Whereas in Mid-State, this role is um, uh, more focused on the marketing aspect. So the, the writing and the things like that and the marketing communications and the strategy um, behind what the artwork is designed to do. So that's a, a lot of what this class is about. It's focused specifically on the marketing communication aspect of, of, of that, less, less of the artwork. There is an art to communication, however, though, I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, and, I, and I think it's very fascinating. Um, communication is a very powerful tool in business. It's a very powerful tool, especially now that we um, um, and have been and will continue to move towards um, uh, more social media um, uh, 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 interactions and marketing and brands are spending a lot of money on social media. Therefore, the communication aspect is becoming that much more important. I would say my day to day job, me doing everything that I do um, in all the different media, including video, I would say probably 20 percent of my time is focused on video, which ends up on social media, which um, the school actually pays to uh, use that work to promote and advertise. Um, I'd say probably 50% of that is like strictly social media posting, going out there, sharing photos, taking photos, uh, sharing that, um, crafting up posts and content for things, responding to comments in the comment feed, um, responding to direct messages through their social media channels, um, tagging other individual organizations and things like that. I'm going to say um, we spend a lot of our marketing budget on uh, social media, specifically Facebook and Instagram. Um, we we spend, you know, if there's ever an issue with low enrollments or things like that, the first thing we say, well, what can we do on social? And then people come and talk to me and then I say, OK, well, you know, um, uh, basically for Facebook, you can, uh, you know, spend a dollar a day. But if we have a campaign that um, is going for a month or so, you know, you might want to spend um, more of your budget up front and then more of your budget towards the back on your social media and then you want to reduce potentially the budget in the middle um, so um, towards the front you gain that excitement so you get a lot more exposure and get more excitement so you put dollars behind that this new shiny object thing in the marketing world you spend a lot of budget on that in the upfront and then towards the back end you spend a lot of bu budget on the back end of that marketing campaign whether it be a month or two months um, to um, gain that sense of urgency, like time is running out, take advantage of the opportunity while you still can. You put more budget behind that messaging at that back end, and then maybe you keep a little bit of budget in the middle just to tie the both ends together and keep the campaign flowing between those two extremes. Let's just say you're doing a direct mail piece, you're doing a handing out flyers, you're telling your salespeople that are out in the field to um, these are your talking points in regard to this campaign and things like that. So all communications, all different channels, all different strategy as to where you're placing your focus, time, money and attention. That's the interesting stuff about marketing that you know kind of fascinates me. That's um, as you move through the marketing program, you definitely will learn a lot of these things. 
um, the product life cycle and things like that. Again, we don't talk about all that stuff in this class. Um, we just focus on the communication aspect and the um, in the that that aspect in and of itself. It's more of an art than a science. Um, however, you know, as you continue on with your careers um, in the in the field and in this uh, in this program, they're going to touch on all of those other things too. Um, those other aspects of a marketing campaign, and then you can kind of take the communication aspects and then use those to fit into um, all of those different buckets that you're going to learn about as you move forward. Um, that's, you know, that's about it. The, what I really think is a benefit of being in the um, education industry is this very um, stable. Um, especially in a two year school. So I think um, as you all move forward and think about your careers um, um, in the future, what you're going to do with your um, uh, program and your credential, definitely think very long term. Um, think as long term as you can. I think education is probably very stable. There was a very much of a point in time where people thought oh, you don't really need education and people are going to stop enrolling in education so much because you can learn everything online. Yeah, you can learn skills online, techniques or tactics online, but you can't learn how to think in a strategic way online. Um, you have to do that by collaborating with other people person to person. Yes, you can collaborate with other people um, digitally and that's fine, but you have to either get a job that collaborates with other people or you have to make an investment in your education to then collaborate with other people. Um, you're, it's going to be very difficult for you to find a group of dedicated people um, with one common goal in mind to collaborate with um, just out of the blue. Like you have friends and they have different interests than you and things of that nature. So you might get lucky. I'd say maybe one in a hundred one in a hundred chance, right? Um, you know, being very, very flexible about that. But, you know, um, that's, that's, I would say it, it's unlikely for the long term future. So that's kind of why I fit into and I kind of am, am sort of coalescing into the education industry because I see that it's not going to go anywhere for quite a long time. And especially the um, the two year school model, rather than the four year university model, because the two year school university model, um, the two year technical college model is such that you can take two years and transfer over to a four year program. I'm not trying to sell anything here, but I'm just kind of giving you an example of of what that product offers as a value add for the two year school over what the four year school provides, which is well take all four years here and the first two years you're going to get. I'm not sure what they say at this point. I can say from my experience that I've taken two years at a community college in Glen Ellen, Illinois called the College of DuPage and transferred over to a four year school and um, my first two years I learned um, basically how to do the job um, that I do now um, from a skill set standpoint. So um, a little bit of copywriting here, a little bit of art direction there, but a lot of um, what was back then Adobe Flash, which was a um, video editing or interactive editing program, uh, interactive design program. Um, totally outdated now ever actually ever since Apple came out with their iPhone, it started just tanking off. Um, but, you know, uh, video programs as well that I learned uh, back then were uh, Adobe Premiere, Adobe Illustrator, um, Adobe InDesign, Adobe Photoshop, and those are things that I use every single day still yet. Um, the concepts of those programs won't go away, um, even if another program or another company wipes Adobe out. They're still going to need vector graphic programs. You're still going to need rasterized graphic programs and photo editing programs. It's just, OK, well, what do those programs look like? However, um, this the concepts will stay the same. OK, so the concepts will stay the same. The te the tech, the techniques might change, you know, based on the different software. And so that's what I mean by the difference between. A formal education or you know, investing in your education or just doing Google searches on things all the time. At the end of the day, 
when you do Google searches um, on YouTube or, or the Google search engines, I know because I've been on the other side of it in the marketing aspect. At the end of the day, the content that you're getting is designed to sell you something. So what we used to do at Quad Graphics was, and I guess maybe I'm going on a little bit of a tangent, but I want to tell you a bit about um, of like my perspective on marketing and where I've come from through my career. Um, what we used to do at Quad Tech was provide educational content out there in the form of answering a question. It's very sort of like um, uh, um, saying, okay, well, our ideal customer will be looking for um, um, a color product to install in a packaging press, let's just say. Um, so a camera that can uh, measure color on a printing press going at 300, you know, uh, 300 uh, impressions per set per minute. I'm not sure about the numbers there. So what would someone like that be typing into the Google search engine and asking to learn about that? Um, they might type in something like, um, what, what are some products that can measure color 300 impressions per, per minute for XYZ printing press? Well, our organization, our marketing team would create a video that says here are the top five you know um here are the top five uh, cameras that are going to measure color at x amount of uh, impressions per second here's another blog article that says here are the top three um, printing presses of uh, uh, printing cameras that are going to be installed on the presses that are going to help you and your company increase your results um these are marketing pieces in the guise of an educational piece no one does anything just for nothing. And so what are we putting in there? Well, we're gonna put the number one camera um, that that is in the market to get you your results is the one that we did because we, the content creator, work for the company that's selling the camera. Okay, so this is this is the this is what inbound, uh, what's called inbound marketing, which is um, us putting our content out there and waiting for people to bite onto that content to buy our product. It's called inbound marketing. So um, inbound marketing can take the form of content on a website, content on a video, um, video content that's you know put in an ad to go on social media, things like that. So um, you know nothing out there is essentially free. Everything is out there for a reason and it's usually to sell a product. So um, that's really the difference between a Google search or a YouTube search and you know an edu education. Um, so that's that's kind of why I stuck around in the industry. Plus, um, you know, in in a world where there's a lot of um, you know things falling off here today, gone tomorrow, um, it 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 was it's a safe bet. So um, I would encourage you all to really think about that and really not be afraid you know i i started teaching probably six years ago or so um part-time um i never thought i would be an instructor i just had got opportunities from people um that um allowed me to experiment and see you know how i was doing you know how i could fare with it and um, it worked out really good. So um, that's, you know, part-time instruction was how I got my foot in the industry. Um, and then I um, uh, was laid off from my um, um, a nonprofit position. And I was out there looking for a job and Midstate saw that I had some teaching on my resume, some teaching experience. Um, they saw I came from a community college um, in my experience, in my interview um, uh, at Mid-State. I talked about that, too, and how I was passionate about community colleges because of my personal experience going through it. Um, and I knew how to do marketing in a nonprofit area and for-profit industry, too. Uh, so they hired me on in the marketing department at the school. So you never know what, like, um, what intermix of experience might work for you in the future, but I came from a time where it was very taboo to go jump from job to job and, and whatever every two or three years. Um, but I did that because I wanted to diversify myself or diversify my experience, learn about experiences in different places. 
And so I think that has um, proven to be a benefit in time where at the time it was proven, you know, it was seen as something that wasn't beneficial. You were looked at as unreliable and things of that nature. Now you're looked at the way I feel I'm looked at is very much more um, flexible and adaptable across industries and things. So all that said, that's a little bit about me. Um, um, I don't have an assignment for all of you all to introduce yourselves to me or each other. Um, since it's not a hybrid class, um, typically I would have everyone turn their cameras on and introduce themselves and I'd ask them some questions and things like that. Um, but, you know, as you guys have questions as we go through the course, um, shoot me emails, uh, ask me questions. Um, I don't have the syllabus done yet. I'm going to have that done tomorrow um, and then post it out there. I'll follow up with an email. Um, but um, essentially, my, op my office hours are pretty open. You can send me a text message via Microsoft Teams um, and just say, hey, Andrew, you're available for a quick chat. A lot of times I am, um, uh, you know, I will, you know, I can take 5, 10, 15 minutes, you know, out of the day to just do a face to face uh, uh, chat with you meeting to talk about an assignment. Um, I can pull the assignment up on my screen. We can walk through it. Um, I've done that many times. A lot of students that have been struggling with any piece of content for maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes. All, all they need from me is about five minute quick conversation. Um, it could even be just text messages back and forth, which is which is what have been done in the past. Um, and then I can get them on their way and get moving. So I would encourage you not to struggle with any kind of things that you might be having trouble with. Um, just nip it in the bud, send me a message. Um, if I don't get to it within like three minutes, I'll get to it within like 15 or 20 or, um, uh, you know, I get messages on my phone and stuff too. So I'll just text you and say, hey, I'll get back to you in 10 or whatever. Um, or we can set up a meeting and, and you know, uh, a virtual meeting and then go from there. I do have an uh, office on the Wisconsin Rapids campus. It's on the second floor. Um, if you need to meet in person, that's OK, too. Just send me a text message and we'll uh, write you something if that's if that's needed. Um, so just know that I'm available to you. Um, and my office hours are very much open because that's kind of where the environment we work in now is just I'm a text message away essentially. So don't feel like you need to be struggling or anything like that um, through any kind of pro um, things that uh, projects you're working on and stuff like that. So let's get through week one here. Um, I think I got a good overview to you guys of what we're talking about basically focusing on marketing communications the fundamentals of marketing communications right let me give you a tour of blackboard here so um here we are in the fundamentals of marketing communications class uh, you go under learning plans of course you all are very familiar with that um, I have week one open here. These other weeks I have um, uh, hidden at this time um, because I don't want to clutter up a, a, a Blackboard at this point right now. So just focus on week one here. Once you click on that, um, what I'm doing here, the way I kind of designed this is I in blue put the projects so those projects stand out. As we jump out of here in the learning plan under week one, as we gain more weeks through the semester, one through eight, um, the current week, what I'm going to do is change the color of it to make that blue, too. So the current week will stand out. So next week, week one is going to be back to black and then week two is going to um, be that color that I uh, had that blue color. So I'll just go ahead and do that now. So this stands out. Uh, so there you have it, uh, week one there. Um, I'm going to have a link to the lecture and demo here. Um, I had these demos, um, these lectures actually recorded uh, from a couple years ago, um, but I am re-recording them uh, for this semester um, uh, just as things might have changed, you know, over time. And um, a lot of what I like to do uh, in the classes that I teach is 
um, kind of relate them to what might be happening in the real world today, right? So um, a lot of things uh, come up, like especially during like the pandemic in 2020, I believe, um, you know, there were different um, organizations doing different things that were very unique to the pandemic and they were positioned very well, such as Amazon during the pandemic, during a class that I was teaching at the time, which is fundamentals of uh, marketing. Um, and and so that subject matter made its way into the class and we talked about it. So it's always good to like update and refresh your uh, your your work. I'm going to share this link and it's going to be on YouTube as well. So you'll be able to access it through your phone, using your headphones to listen to it if you need to or anytime 24 seven as well. So um, it will be the link will be here on Blackboard. Just click on it. It'll just open up a YouTube link um, uh, out of that. Um, OK, so let me jump in here. Um, first thing uh, that that I kind of talk about on the first day of this class is the uh, editorial style guide. This is kind of like an art visual art type thing, but this is a a visual style guide. Um, uh, and I have the PDF here. You'll just kind of click it and download it um, on your machine. And actually, I'll hit this download button here in the upper right so I can just save the um, PDF version so I can uh, navigate around um, better. That way, I like to zoom in and things like that really fluidly. So let me move this over. Um, OK, so every brand is going to have what's called a visual identity guide. Some people call it, some organizations call it a visual style guide. But what this does is um, uh, it is a piece of communications that um, every brand will have that um, is provided to usually a um, team of graphic designers or a marketing team. It could be an internal marketing team, like for this in, in this instance, this is MidState's official one. We still use this now, um, although we're changing our brand and that's kind of a side, side thing um, right now, but this is a great example that is current. Um, an internal team like mine or an external organization that is um, that is doing graphic design work for us. So if MidState as a brand wants to make sure that all of our content looks consistent across the board, no matter who works on it, very similar to that McDonald's print analogy, right? McDonald's red being the same between China and, J and Japan and, uh, you know, um, uh, another country, Spain, Mexico, United States. Well, there's different printers that are serving. That. There's not one printer that's going to print out all of the packaging for the entire world because that is just completely pretty much impossible for one printer that has a boatload of printing presses to be running them. They can't run that stuff fast enough because there's so many, so many people. There's so much need. There's so much content that needs to be produced. It has to be distributed to different places. And that's very much the same in this situation here, where MidState as a marketing team of four, with what we have now, including myself, we can only do so much. So in the case that we hire on another external organization to help us with marketing content, we want to make sure, right, that our MidState red is the same uh, red that they produce as the one that we produce here internally. So this is what this style guy will actually do. So um, usually a style guy will have like a lot of this fluff stuff in the beginning. What is visual identity? It's not a name or a logo. All the elements of communication look, blah, blah, blah. This is very fluffy stuff. For me, I like the fluffy stuff, but um, it's not very functional because I'm more of a designer person. So I like to look at the stuff and say, I like to get right to the heart of it. Like, okay, this needs to be a resource for me to be help to help me. What this stuff does here is, you know, tell give people contact information, put this whole document into context. Probably someone that doesn't know anything about visual style guides at all um, will need a little bit of an explanation like this here. Um, 
Uh, positioning statement here. This is like a statement that kind of gives the idea to the um, per uh, the organization or the person that's working on the brand as to how to think while they're designing the content. So whatever they're producing and putting together um, has that same um, uh, has that same uh, feeling uh, behind it. Again, this is m very much more of an art than a science. So. The saying goes, what you think about, you bring about. So Mid-State Technical College transforms the lives of our students and strengthens our communities by creating career-ready employees to make an immediate impact in their new careers. We're focused on strengthening our communities and creating career-ready employees. So what you think about, you bring about. So if this organization that is working on the Mid-State content is thinking, um, my goal is to um, uplift communities and create career ready employees. OK, I'm going to work on this brochure. Now they have a perspective to create this brochure that fits with what the brand visual, the, the brand of mid state is all about. So brand is not like a logo or colors or font necessarily only in that in and of itself although that for me as a designer is what's probably most important a brand is also the strategy of the um of the organization that it represents so you have to have that and that is mostly conveyed through the copy that you use through the text that you write um, through the questions that you answer or don't answer on social media, through the um, uh, uh, through the um, new and up and coming movements that might be coming out in our society, what does Mid State want to um, stand behind? Does Mid State want to stand behind, you know, this movement or that movement, or where does a Mid State's uh, position or stance on um, this? Um, this aspect of where society is going versus that aspect, right? The whole um, education is not important uh, because you can Google search every, everything. Well, how does mid, what does mid state stand on that issue, right? And that is something that the the brand here and probably the brand positioning statement specifically gives some insight into you know, some of the public relations people and how they would answer questions and address some of those things in in the real world. Um, so just some stuff to think about there. Um, marketing messages, key marketing messages. So the, this is the kind of the nuts and bolts of the copywriting aspect of it. So um, our core messages is we're providing the supportive environment to students to complete their program, et cetera, et cetera. Um, vital source for educational and economic needs of communities it serves. So Mid-State doesn't just do education. Um, we also do um, uh, workforce training, work, workplace training, and we um, we retrain individuals that might have uh, lost their jobs or things like that, or um, we retrain individuals that want to move up within an organization that they've been in for a long time and um, they just need to um, update their skill sets for new software or things that might be coming out or new processes and that type of stuff. Uh, so we just do more than just teaching people um, in these different programs, right? And then this, so this is something, these are aspects of the brand that are important to solidify in this document so we can give it to, again, another organization or give it to an internal creative team and they can, um, uh, use that the use those things right that use those facts um to incorporate into the marketing promotions that they're creating as as fit okay like if it's if it's the right fit of course you can't say everything you know in one marketing piece because you know that doesn't make any sense like it has to be in you know you want to bucket things out right and so if you give if you give these organizations this marketing message and this content, um, they are empowered then to bucket these messages out in the areas that they see best fit. Is this a good fit for a text message um, talking about um, uh, mid-state uh, being a resource for the educational economic needs of the community? Um, or is it 
um, hey, uh, a welcoming and supportive environment. You know, maybe that is something that's more of a personal message that belongs in a text or a personal one to one email rather than a big idea that gets broadcasted to the general public. OK, Th that's where audience comes in and the um, relevancy uh, for the marketing messages per who that audience member is. So that's all something that should be taken into account in the marketing uh, uh, in marketing communications as well. It's very much about audience. Um, audience doesn't have to be just age, male, female, um, country of origin, geographic area as well. Um, uh, audience and demographics are um, how much money they make, um, how much education they have. Do they have a high school a degree? Are they a doctorate or do they have a four year bachelor degree, uh, master's degree, these types of things? Um, do are they savvy with technology or are they not savvy with technology? Do they prefer face to face communication or do they prefer um, email or um, a virtual a, a virtual remote communication? That type of thing or do, do they live in rural areas or do they live more in this in the city and urban areas? OK, um, uh, greater populations or less populations. Um, what are their, uh, you know, what are their political affiliations, you know, stuff like this. These are all things that um, define people as a certain demographic and marketing, effective marketing and effective marketing communication speaks to those specific demographics um, like 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 they're a friend, like they understand each other. One of the things. Um, I grew up and my uh, grandparents were uh, uh, spoke fluent Greek. They were not even born in the US. Um, and I grew up um, communicating with them despite them really knowing a lot of English, but a lot of the broken English. And it was broken up. There was a little bit of Greek, a little bit of English. And I was just kind of trying to put it all together and then and then spit back kind of understanding what they were you know uh, um, uh, responding to them as best i could it wasn't perfect but i got the essential message across i'm hungry i want you know a cheeseburger or i'm thirsty or i'm tired I'm, i need to go to bed very basic basic things that um basic communication um goals that we had between each other and so that's kind of the very similar thing you have to speak the language of your audience in order to connect with them effectively so a good and effective marketing communicator would be someone that can speak to all of these different audiences unbiasedly um and un um um and, and not in a way that is super cliche but in a way that's super authentic um to these different audiences and then that's how you 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 would become a very effective marketing communicator um uh let's see here okay so this is just talking a little bit about um some of these different markets that we have in mid-state and what our desired um, outcomes for these individuals would be so for example a current student we'd want to make sure that they were retained and uh, which means retention, meaning we want them to continue taking classes with us. We want to retain them semester for as semester. We don't want to lose them to another school or organization or just lose them, period, and have them go out there with, you know, without completing their uh, degree and and never coming back. Um, another desired audience outcome would be to get a current student to refer another student to become a student and things of that nature. So that's a little bit about what that talks about. Then we get into the nuts and bolts, the mid-state logos. This is kind of like what the um, what I was talking about earlier from a graphic design background, what I would be interested in seeing um, uh, first and foremost uh, uh, for myself. Is, see, in my earlier life, I was more the graphic person. I wasn't the kind of person that was like the strategic marketer type. I got into this industry as a creative. I continue to be a creative uh, person. That's like my strength here. Um, over the past 15 years of doing this, I've, I've been around a lot of enough marketing people and enough diverse marketing people to know that I'm um, uh, as good of a marketer as them. 
you know, despite having the formal education behind it and things of that, when you have real world experience and you soak up again, like I was talking about earlier, everyone having a common goal and being together and working together um, uh, on a common goal, um, you learn a lot from each other. So that's the difference between education and just doing a solo Google search on your own is you have that environment and all of those people to um, basically make you be better and you can soak up a lot of their different types of knowledge. Okay, it's like taking a seed and putting it into one type of soil over the other. Um, you know, it's about the soil. Like that's going to make the seed grow really, really strong or kind of weak. So it's a very similar type of analogy there. But effectively, this is kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, my thing. So this, this will show you all the approved logos, the black and white version, the white version, and then the color version here um, with the maroon and the 90% um, black. It's not actually 100% black there. Um, for the text. Um, and this will also show you the minimum size um, that the logo should be in both the vertical and the horizontal format. Um, it'll also show you how much space of clearance you need to have around the logo so the logo doesn't look cluttered or too close to another element or another logo. Um, so, you know, if MidState is too close to a different logo, we don't want it to be like, you know, MidState coffee or something like that. Like, we don't want people to mistake all that. Um, we just want to make sure that it has enough space and separate from a logo. It, you know, this prevents any kind of um, artistic, artistic expression, you know, from um, from anyone out there that just wants to be creative and different. You want to sort of, I mean, not not like overly regulate it, but give give some guidelines that you know are reasonable to other designers and things. Um, we give our PMS color. So the maroon is actually called PMS 202. PMS is is Pantone. Uh, so the Pantone color um, books are basically um, swatches of color, and there's like hundreds, hundreds of Pantone colors. But this is the color system that is used across all of the printing industry across the world. So McDonald's red has a Pantone color, probably called something like McDonald's Red, or it's like PMS 303, 202, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's not 202, because obviously mid-state is, but whatever that color is, um, that Pantone color can be matched uh, from one press to another across the world without anybody even talking. All they have to do is say Pantone this, that, and the other number. And then, so that's, that's how, that's uh, our Pantone color. So whatever printing process that is done, um, whether it be on screen, right, that which is not a printing process at all, but colors on a screen, um, a website someone else does, um, a business card, a business card that's laminated, a business ca card that um, has a texture on it, um, any kind of print piece printed anywhere, it has to match the Pantone 202 color. Um, and how do you how do you measure that? How do you make sure you have someone look at it and say, OK, here's the Pantone swatch. I'm putting it next to the screen. OK, that color looks right. OK, we're good. Uh, here's that Pantone swatch. I'm putting it next to the business card that got printed on this machine. OK, that looks right now. It got printed on that machine. OK, that's wrong. We need to add a little bit more red to the inks. And then they'll do their thing. They'll tinker around with it, add more red, and then and then we'll look at it again. So that's kind of how that's done. Um, <clears throat> very small example, but it's on a bigger scale for much larger brands. Uh, Midstate is not a large enough brand, um, I think, to um, have like what they call press checks, which are which is are what I'm describing, where you would take a Pantone swatch and go actually to the print location and, and match it eye for eye. Um, Midstate doesn't produce that much stuff because our community that we serve is central Wisconsin, um, Adams, Marshfield, uh, Wisconsin Rapids, and Stevens Point. Um, 
a company that would print like hundreds of thousands of pieces that are serving like the United States or the East Coast or West Coast or those, now they, they would have press checks because when they have a print run, they're going to pr be printing hundreds of thousands of of pieces of content and the budget behind that you could lose a lot of money if the color isn't right i'll give you an example so um uh if you go to the grocery store and you see a stack of pepsi 12 packs in boxes stacked up at the end of an aisle and one of them is faded right like faded blue box the blue Pepsi box, but everything else is real crisp and like the Pepsi blue, like everyone knows, but you have like a couple that are faded. Are you going to pick up the faded box or are you going to pick up the box that isn't faded or the color isn't off? You're going to pick up the one that of the color that isn't off because you're going to, your mind is going to tell you that, oh, the content inside of those boxes is fresh, but the other content in those boxes, that's old because that, you know, print job is bad. Right. So just because the, the soda inside is going to be exactly the same, it's the perception. The perception is the reality here. And that's essentially kind of what marketing really is, is all about per, uh, playing off of per, people's perceptions. So that's the color piece there. Uh, logo guidelines here. We have a couple of different variations of the Mid-State logo. So we have a variation of Mid-State in demand, which is a little bit of a tagline. Um, we have uh, clubs and organizations, so we have a system created. So if there's a club, if someone wants to do the Student Society of Arboriculture, Early Childhood Education Club, um, chess club, uh, math club, uh, um, finger painting club, whatever the club, it's not a unique logo, it's this. It's a mid-state technical college, just as you see it, and then the text is whatever that club is underneath, just like that. So we preempt any any anything that's like, well, we want a special logo for the painting club, and it has to have a paintbrush and and uh, you know um, a palette, and we want to have like you know three different colors and ink splatters and. The marketing department doesn't do that. We just say, okay, well, here's your official club seal. It's a technical college painting club. And then, so a lot of brands, like uh, brands that create, that have like sub brands underneath them um, do this. Some don't, there's, there's large corporations that have sub brands underneath them that are completely different. You'd never even know that those sub brands were actually part of that major brand, um, like Philip Morris or something like that, or, um, there's there's other brand um, you know huge brands out there too that that are uh, escaping me Kimberly Clark and you know Kimberly Clark has like Kleenex and all these other different tissue companies and stuff like that underneath them. Um, some brands go that route uh, where actually they have sub brands that actually compete with each other too um, to serve different markets. Like I said, the income uh, demographic piece. There's uh, uh, there's companies out there that have sub brands that compete with each other. Um, Tide versus Gain. Well, Gain appeals to a certain income and demographic, and Tide appeals to a certain income demographic, or things like that. So, and the prices are different. Tide and Gain they compete with each other, but they're under the same company. I forget. I, I don't think it's Kimberly Clark. I think it's someone else. It's someone else that I, this is escaping me. But that, that's something you learn about in the uh, fundamentals of marketing uh, class. Um, uh, logo guidelines, examples of incorrect use, um, squished, stretched. Um, there's a logo that's not used as an old one logo here. Um, these are other logos that were created. The link is our, of course, our uh, learning, uh, uh, basically our library on the different campuses. So we have a brand for that. Um, so yeah, that outlines a little bit of that. Um, unacceptable ways to refer to the name. This is very marketing communication esque. Um, you you know, it's against the rules to say MSTC. It's against the rules not to have the hyphen between Mid State and the Technical College and things like that. Calling it Mid State College is not allowed. Calling it Mid State Tech is not allowed. Of course, you can say whatever you want, but it's just this is the printed materials it's defining. 
um, what you can and can't say in print um, as a marketer of the organization. Of course, if you were to do a Facebook post as a student and then call it MSTC, well, Mid State's not going to come at, like come after you. I mean, because you have the freedom to do whatever you want on your own, um, you know, social media platform. That's between you and the social media platform, not Mid State um, uh, necessarily. In that case, on how you want to, um, uh, uh, I guess, like write out, you know, your reference to Mid State in any such way. Um, you could, you know, you could use a W instead of the M and call it with state, and, you know, that's your own freedom. Uh, so, so that's kind of that um, idea there. Um, primary color, so we have the uh, CMYK ink conversion. That's a little bit more of the creative stuff. RGB, more of the creative stuff. That's the screen, uh, the screen color combination. Uh, Pantone, like I mentioned earlier, so we have this gray, which is like almost black, but not quite black. It's actually 90% black. Black is K. So this is just printing terminology. Um, and you learn about that in the Adobe uh, visual design class more so. I used to teach that. Um, I think we still offer it, but I'm not sure. Um, I think we probably do. Uh, typography, so this is going to outline all the different fonts that, um, that the organization uses. So uh, Kimberly is a font that is used. Um, we use it and then here's the um, application. So call outs, headlines, things like that. Uh, more typography, Gotham is the body copy font. So, we, you know, you this is very um, industry standard of how, you know, those fonts are laid out and outlined for the designer to use. Here's the different um, widgets and all that stuff. Um, here's an example of a brochure. Our stuff looks different now because, again, like I said, we're updating the guidelines and things like that, and updating the branding. Um, in in our case now at Mid State, um, just like an inside thing is like we're changing the look and feel of everything, and and we're going to then create the brand guidelines after we change it, um, because that's more realistic. It, it you know it's like the cart before the horse, right? Do you establish the guidelines first and then start creating the content in that new look, or sometimes you just want to create the stuff in the new look and then say okay. This looks good for a brochure or a whatever. Um, let's apply this look to a business card. Let's apply this look to a PowerPoint presentation. Let's apply it to the web pages. Um, does it look good across the board? Yeah. Okay. Let's let's rubber stamp it into a guideline, and then we'll and then we'll um, we have something we can you know hang our hat on for the branding. Um, and then, yeah, just uh, examples here of of how these different fonts are being used in these different applications. OK, so a copy of that is uh, on the. Um, on Blackboard. Um, there for you, so that's just a little bit of that. Um, editorial style guide is another piece here. I'm not going to go through this one as heavily because this is very, very in depth. Um, so let me save that. But just to give you an idea of what an editorial style guide is, um, it's a little bit like a visual style guide, except less visual. This is specifically focusing on how things are spelled out um whether things are capitalized whether they're not and things of that nature so just a little example here now feel free to go through this as as you as you um see fit i'm not going to go through it in too much uh, example here um uh, but how do we do uh african american asian american we don't hyphenate it okay so even those level of detail of things are actually outlined here um, link uh, is the name of our library and learning commons facilities. Use the in the front of link, but do not capitalize it, the link. OK, so basically the L, the L is capital, but the I is lowercase. And then you say the, you have to say. You have to call it the link, not just link. So it has to be like this, the link. And then the I has to be lowercase. So just like thing, little rules and stuff like that. 
um, that um, our uh, content, our content people will put together. Now, this is again to give to a vendor, uh, to give to a new person that's coming on board, so they understand like as they're writing content for the brand, what what some of the rules, quote unquote, are for the brand, right? Like, so how do we use the link? Where do we use the commas? Where do we or the dashes and things like that? Um, do not use apostrophes to form plurals. Okay, so these are just a lot of copywriting things, like copywriting rules. So the one first thing I showed you was more of the visual stuff. This one is more of the copywriting stuff. Um, so I go into the more, I think, meteor stuff here. Like, so we have, um, yeah, what's a, when we're referencing the district board and stuff, what to capitalize, what not to. Room spaces is a big one too, um, you know, uh, these are just the ways in which we like we're not cat. We don't capitalize auditorium bookstore and so on and so on. Do not use spaces or dashes for room numbers. OK, so it's just all one block of word or letter and number rather than dashes after the A. So this is just to make sure that all of the written content is consistent across the board. Here's a nice list of um how we outline the salon so the salon is a little bit unique because it has that ampersand um, and no space between salon and mid-state and so that's accurate and consistent across the board of all the different pieces so we just hired a person and she has access to this thinks she does a lot of copywriting so she has access to this and then she provides the copy and then gives it to me for the printed stuff so all this is pretty much work is done for me, but this just gives you a sense of how detailed this can get. Um, uh, you know, foreign country cities, sometimes cities, you don't necessarily need um, a country here. So you don't necessarily have to say like um, Stevens Point, Wisconsin. I mean, not for us because we all know where Stevens Point is because of our uh, region, but um, you know, big cities like Chicago, you don't need to say Chicago, Illinois, you just say Chicago. This is the same thing, Bangkok, London, Thailand, Toronto. That's what they're saying is like um, some of these foreign cities, you don't necessarily have to say like London, England or um, Bangkok, Thailand or Tokyo, Japan. Um, so this is just saying that you can just say those major cities if they're like big and more well known enough. It's a little bit of an art there. The big one is dates and dashes and stuff like that. All of these different rules. Um, Mid state has this documentation outlining it. There's um, different uh, writing styles. Basically, you've probably heard of AP style um, um, and uh, M uh, um, Chica Chicago style. I think I don't, I've been writing with a AP style for probably the last eight years of my career. Um, so. AP style is basically like a national, uh, it's, it's like a universal style of, of writing. So if Mid-State was like, hey, we just do a AP style, that, that's our that's our editorial style. Um, you could just go buy the AP style book and then just use that as your reference rather than create your own. However, Mid-State has created their own. So this is the one that we have to use as a marketing team. So I just wanted to share that with you. You could download that as well and just kind of look through that. Um, I wanted to do um, a little bit of a look at our Facebook page because this is a big, um, big marketing communication piece for us. So um, first thing I want to look at with you guys is, well, let's see here. Our standard operating procedure. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I wanted to just show you a little bit of what a standard operating procedure is. So I manage the, um, I've been managing the, the social media page for Mid-State for, oh, well, as long as I've been here. So like past four years. Um, so it's effectively, um, a standard operating procedure is a document that is uh, written out. Now, I didn't 
really do this one. I didn't write this one out, but this gives you an idea of what it is. Um, these are steps that, th these, these are procedures that someone can receive from, from us um, to understand then how to broadcast the Facebook Live video, um, how to end the broadcast, other things um, to keep in mind. Um, uh, uh, if you lose Wi-Fi connection, what to do, things of that nature. So these are like step-by-step -step best practices um, and things like that. Okay, so this is an SOP standard operating procedure that was created. Actually, uh, I probably updated that one too uh, in 2020. But that's kind of the gist of that. Um, and you and that is, I included that up there on Blackboard. But the one thing I wanted to show you, and this pertains to our um, project for this week, um, is the standard operating procedure for um, Facebook that I that I created here. So this, I'm not going to go through this in too much in too much detail here, um, but I'm just going to kind of give you the high level. Um, so. This document could be, uh, what I did was I created this document and I gave it to um, uh, one of our um, one of our student leaders in our student life department, and he manages this uh, student life Facebook group. So that's the group of students within the Facebook, Mid-State Facebook page, that umbrella page. So he, um, he received this document. This gave him some ideas about what to do and how to manage Facebook um, in these different ways. So uh, now, you know, he asked me questions every once in a while, and I, I am always looking at what's getting posted on his page and things like that, and I help him out when he can. He helps me out when he can. Um, it makes my life a lot easier having someone also helping me, although I'm not completely hands off or anything, but I'm not you know, I'm not like over, over involved in it either. I'm very hands off with it. I just kind of like oversee and make sure nothing major is going crazy out there. Um, so uh, basically it, tell, it will tell you, um, this document gives you some, some uh, kind of uh, strategies and settings that you can put on Facebook. Like you can do a do not disturb option. So you can um, you can turn uh, uh, sounds uh, on or off um, in the in the in the uh, in your software that will help you kind of disconnect from social media because you can literally just be it can be overwhelming to um, to manage it. Um, especially, I can tell you, after four years of managing social media, is incredibly overwhelming. You're you're always getting like questions on days off whenever there's a snow day that's potentially going to be a snow day you get questions of is school open tomorrow or not things like that so you get a lot of stuff you get a lot of random stuff and you got to get a lot of questions that you're not going to know the answers to so you got to learn how to you know um you got to learn how to disconnect from it for a while so you can come back fresh from it you know uh, so those are just uh, some tips on how to get that done um, how to set up um, automatic responses. Um, here's some of the um, automatic responses you can set in Facebook. So I have this um, outlined here. These are like the messages that you would send, or this is the, the message you could literally just copy um, and paste in. You can actually have Facebook input the first name. So whoever messages Facebook, um, you can copy this message, put it in, and then Facebook will then automatically message back and say, hey, thanks for messaging us, Sam or Tim or whoever it is. Um, and it'll look like it, come, it came from someone who was actually writing it. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff too with AI going on, you know, very soon, uh, someone managing a Facebook page will probably be an AI bot doing it. Um, which would be, uh, I mean, it, I don't know. It it might be uh, it might be nice in some instances, but um, it might be um, actually, yeah, hard for people to keep their jobs with with something like that. You never know. You never know if that technology is going to pick up or not. Um, you know, you'd think it it would be a little more advanced than it is by now, um, but you know, maybe it's maybe it's not. Um, yeah, you know. 
I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm definitely thinking about that too. I've heard of some news stories about that lately, but anyhow. Um, yeah, just what to do. Uh, this one, especially here, this is tied to the project that, that I'm uh, uh, assigning to you guys for the week. So uh, Facebook comments, we get a lot of comments that are very, um, I would say irrelevant um, and questions that are irrelevant to our overall audience that someone might be specifically interested in. And so I have a, um, uh, an example of that. But this is how to respond to comments um, and decide whether they should be responded to publicly on the Facebook page or just an instant message, like messaged um, uh, on a private private area. So, um, so it goes, uh, many of our Facebook events uh, drawing a lot of questions. Questions are visible to the public, blah, 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 many times the, the uh, um, so uh, procedure part one. So this is this is what I wanted you guys to focus on here. Um, first is you get a question right in a comment feed. Um, hey, this question, blah, 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 blah. Uh, first, you want to define whether or not this question is a question that other users will want to know the answer to as well. OK, if yes, move on to this next step too. If no, respond with hello person, thank you for your question and interest in whatever that interest is. We will circle back with you privately. So essentially MidState is saying, okay, well, this person has a question, but no one else is really going to be interested in the answer to this question because if A might be too personal, like maybe the question is, hey, um, um, Let's see. Hey, this continuing education course seems really interesting, but I can't make it to uh, that course because I have to work. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, can you guys call me when uh, can you call me when, you know, this, that and the other course is is going to happen again? Um, and then you can say in the public, you know, I would say I would not say yes, we'll call you out there in public because we don't want the rest of the public to think that we're going to call them each individually if they want us, you know, to give them a reminder about a class or whatever. We'll just we'll keep that information private and say, you know, because no one, no other users like clearly based on this, no other users are going to want, you know, are really interested in you calling them either as mid state. So we'll just say to that person, hey, um, you know, thanks for your question. We will respond to you privately. OK, the answer to their question is no other people are going to be interested in in the answer that we give. So we keep it private. So um, now if yes, if everyone is interested, if the question is like, hey, is this offer? Is this class offered on Saturdays? OK, well, you know, chances are a lot of the general public, maybe a lot of people will be interested in knowing the answer to that question. So um, then you move on to step two and you say, well, deter determine as the as the Facebook uh, manager, determine whether or not the answer to the question is obvious to you as the Facebook manager or if the information can be found on the MidState website. If yes, move on to the next step. So if the answer can be found um, on the website, uh, answer the question, directly to the customer. So if the customer is like, yeah, is this uh, offered on Saturdays? Well, you could find that information if you did a little bit of a search. But us being like um, an organization that serves people, um, the the manager of the social media page would be like, oh, OK, I could just search our website, find the answer to the question and give it to the person. And they'll be on their way. So that's step three, answer the question. Mm, if not, if you can't answer the question, um, if you now, if you can't, now here's two things. If you can't answer the question and the rest of the public people outside of the organization would be interested in it, then answer the question in the comment feed. If not, then answer the question in a private message. If, if you can find it, the answer, but nobody in the comment feed would really be interested in that, then send them a private message. So maybe it's like, well, you know, is is so-and-so teaching the class? Well, maybe not everyone is going to be interested in knowing who's teaching the class or anything like that. So you can send that in a private message and answer that question. Now, if you can't answer the question, then you move on to step six and then send the inquiry here. This is my previous position, digital and social media specialist, me. 
you would send that question to the manager of the social media page and then that person would reach out to the subject matter expert in the school and then answer the question uh, 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 in the school and then answer the question. They would answer the question that you would answer it via the social media app. Or what I just do is basically say, um, hey, great question. Please send your message to so and so at mstc.edu to get your question answered. So the reason why this whole process is like that um, is to show other uh, spectators of the page that MidState is interested in answering your questions because that's kind of like what our brand is about. Our brand is about answering questions and giving people answers because we're an educational institution. So we have to demonstrate that product on our social media page to make sure that our brand is strong out there and we stand by our values in the eyes of the audience. So that's first and foremost. Um, and it also, um, you know, it's it shows that we are responsive within a very, you know, quick amount of time. So it, we're not like the type of organization that's going to keep you hanging. So um, it's it's all good. All that customer service stuff is seen by the masses, and that helps the brand out in the long run. So that that's the area I wanted you guys to focus on here is whether or not these questions should be answered in front of others based on, well, would others actually care about the answer to this question? Is it relevant to them? Um, even, even it, and I would say if it might be relevant to them in like, I don't know, one in a million people, I would say no. But if it's like maybe one in 10 people would be interested in something like that, then yeah, answer the question publicly. If it's if it's you know too personal or is too unique or too specific of a question, no one's gonna really care. Like the general public doesn't need to know about that. Just circle back and say, hey, thanks for your question. We'll send you a message privately. This both says to the public, hey, we're um, you know recognizing this person and answering their question, but privately because we know you guys really don't you know, care about the answer to this question or it might be too personal. And, and B, it's telling the person, hey, look out privately, so we're going to send you a message, you know, so heads up. Um, and so that's pretty much the, there's more to this document here. Um, uh, follow our inquiries, there's just some examples about how, what we say when school might be canceled, to, uh, you know, because of snow and things like that. These are all copy and paste responses. Um, in the document, and then actually this is a, a shorter version of the major, the big document here. Um, here's responses for negative reviews. These things can just be copied and pasted, you know, here. So that's what this was designed for. If we get a negative review, this could just be copied, pasted, and then tweaked maybe a little bit um, based on um, who, you know, who this person can contact at MidState for their um, concern or negative review and the email of that subject matter expert internally um, and of course what the person's name is that is leaving this negative uh, status message or things like that. So these are things that have been pre-crafted, thought out from a communication standpoint could just be copied and pasted and then this document right could just be shared with other people like I did. I shared this with uh, Vic who manages our um, uh, student life Facebook group. So that document, keep that in mind. Oops, did I just close out? Oh no, here we go. So keep that document in mind, because as we go here, um, here, I wanted to, let me go into the project two real quick, and then I'll circle back on this email assignment, because um, that's just a little real quick thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, I am running out of steam a little bit, but I'm gonna, so I'm going to blow through this pretty quick here. Um, okay, so again, the projects are outlined in blue. So project two, I'm going to go over social media because that's because that's because I just went over that um, Facebook document here that this is a little bit relevant for. If you download. Uh, what I have here is the assignment and the SOP document snippet. So the SOP social media doc um, file here, this is the snippet um, that I actually shared, and you'll just want to go down to post comments, and this will be the area that you'll want to 
um, use to answer the question that I have in the assignment. And so here's the assignment. OK, so the assignment basically is uh, due for January 31, Tuesday. Um, all of my assignments are due like before midnight. OK, so um, January 31 midnight, which is, you know, January 31st at midnight. So um, it, that gives you the whole entire day. But essentially here it gives you three scenarios. Uh, so these are the questions. So scenario one. That's question one, scenario two, that's question two, and scenario three is question three. Scenario one, uh, Mid-State has a Facebook event called From Hamilton to West Side Story, Identifying Our American Experience. So this basically event here is um, a course uh, that um, Facebook has for uh, people that can pay to just go, go and take the course. It's like a few hours or something like that, and they can learn about something unique. So um, it's a continuing education course that says here, what you can do is click on this link and open this course up. And what I want you guys to do, I need to open there, one second. OK, so here's like the description of it here. But what I wanted. Really kind of. Go ahead and hold on a second, guys. OK. Working fine earlier. Hold on a second. Okay. Yeah. So you click on that link and then it'll take you to the event here. So this is a past event. Um, but it's a class. We set these classes up as events on Facebook so people can register. So once you go here, what I want you guys to do is kind of read through the description here. Um, and then get the, get a sense of who would be interested in this class. Who are we going to market to? Who would be the demographic based on the copy here? Um, so, you know, some of the things um, that it talks about here. Um, distance learning program 1996 was the first of its kind of major conservatory divided to exploring the use of state of the art video conference technology. A lot of presentations include blah, blah, blah. So what? Do founding father and Pacific theater of New World War II and mid-century Puerto Rican street gang have all in common? OK, so if if some of these things might be relevant to the audience, what would those things be? So Facebook essentially has, I'll go to one of our events that we have here. Facebook has um, different things that you can target. I'll go into our events. Uh, in ads. So uh, if I were to go here and then click boost on one of these events here, this is going to open up our ad builder on Facebook. And down here, there's audience details. So you can these you can target who your audience is going to be. So you can say men or women or men and women between the ages of 27 and 53 uh, within this geographic region. Let's say it's Stevens Point. Let's say this course is offered in Stevens Point only. And then you can go down here and then select some interests. Uh, OK, so this is an EMT class. I'll delete all the pre-filled in interests. Uh, so you can say um, emergency management. Um, we can browse here to the different categories. So we can see education level. Um, everyone that has, let's say, has an associate degree. Mm, some college, some grad school, high school grad. Uh, let's see. Um, work. Industries. 
these might be government employee, let's say healthcare medical services. So EMT protective services. So anyone in this industry with that the age group that we had, men and women, um, whether they're parents or not, you can say all parents, you can define parents with these types of children, relationship status, are they married, are they single? You can do a lot of different things. This is what this is what advertisers pay Facebook to have access to this information, financial information. We can target households, the top 5%, top 25 to 50%, things like that. So if these are all part of the demographic, you just plug those in there. You save the audience. You define what your budget is going to be. So let's say it's like 10 bucks. You run it for 10 days. Some buck a day. And it says here, estimated daily results. You're estimated to have three to 14 uh, link clicks a day. Um, you're estimated to reach between 357 and 1,000 uh, accounts. Um, so that's how many people are going to be um, exposed to the ad. Things of that nature. So that's kind of what this question is getting to is in order to sell, to, to create an ad, what would we do? What demographic specs below would you use to target a group of individuals that might be interested in signing up for this from Hamilton to Southwest Side Story Identifying the American Experience course? And so, right, so I have in these areas, the age ranges, uh, so let's say it's like uh, 55 to 65 plus. What you guys can do is literally just in Microsoft Word here, um, just click on the Home tab and then you can just highlight your choices if you'd like. Um, you know, so let's say it's like these choices or whatever. Who do you think would be interested in that? What locations would they be interested in? Well, the first clue would be like, where is this location going to be held at? So where is the event going to be held at? So once you click on the link, look for, uh, look in the description and see um, what campus that's going to be held at. And that'll give you a clue as to what location you want here. And we're, we work in 25 mile radiuses. Okay, so just highlight that. Um, and then interests, so you can select the entertainment interests that the person might be interested in based on what the description is etc. Music interests, just highlight the ones that are relevant, highlight the, the hobbies and activities that Facebook has that are relevant in there. Um, and these are all these are all like things that are taken from the, the data that Facebook makes um, allowable uh, to advertisers. So just highlight those in there and that'll be question one, or I call them scenario really. So scenario two, mid has taken photos of dishes, hospitality management students have prepared in class. These images were posted to Facebook to promote the program and enlist new enrollments. Okay, so here's the post. Now, what this is saying is that there's two comments, two users and two comments. How would you respond to these two users and comments based on that document we went over earlier, the SOP, the social media SOP? So first one is, let me roll down here. All right, first one is, okay, and here's the instructions. So I just had the post here, our hospitality management students stepped into the kitchen yesterday to, be, to begin the introduction of food production course, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, potato gnocchi is one of the things that um, was cooked in the course. So it says, using the SOP document that references how to address post comments, that section that we talked about. How would you respond to the comments from Midstate Friends followers below? Be sure to describe whether or not you would answer the question privately in the comment feed, right? Like we talked about, if it's private, that means it'd be just relevant to that specific person um, and the public would not really care about the answer to, or publicly in the comment feed where if it's that one out of 10 people might be interested in it, post it public so other people can maybe have their answer, their question answered without having to answer the question. A lot of people are afraid to ask questions these days. So the first one is, 
um, user question comment one. My grandma has a recipe for potato gnocchi. Potato gnocchi. How do you you uh, what do you use to cook that potato gnocchi? I don't want to get into a program to learn something I already know. OK, would some now go through the process here? Um, what you want to do is respond to the comment here. In your answer, so you could just highlight it so it stands out. Just click the little highlight icon and give it a space or something. Hi. First name. Thank you for your question. OK. Now tell me what you would say to them. And then say and then give me a note that says. This answer would be. Private. Oops, private or public. Just let me know whether or not you would answer this question private or publicly, okay? And then same for this next one. This user says, I looked on the website, cannot find where to find the program guide, so I can know all of the details for each of the class. Can you help me? How would you answer, how would you go through, how would you go through, would you go through this process and how would you answer that question by using this process, okay? And then that's it for that one. And again, just just give me like a. Just make it obvious that that's that's your answer to the question by just writing it out and then highlighting it something like this. And then again, like let me know is it private or public. OK, just let me know. Uh, and then the last question, Midstate has a new podcast called Profile Central Wisconsin. Now here's an important thing. This podcast is sponsored by Portage County Business Council. OK, so here's the post that I have for it. Now, here's the two questions. Based on what you see in the promotional post below, what organizations would you tag in the post? OK, so on Facebook, we know tagging is super important because if we tag another organization that has a bunch of followers, then it, then that organization sees that we tag them and they comment on our post or like our post, that means that our post is going to get, get exposed to all of their group of followers, helping us potentially grow our following via that sort of brand interaction on Facebook. So um, based on this description here, where it says Profile Central Wisconsin is a podcast, blah, 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 about the origins, okay? This post here, read through this. Let me know what organizations you would post. Remember, I highlighted this. This podcast is co-sponsored by Portage County Business Council. You can barely see the Portage County Business Council logo here, but definitely, um, definitely keep that in mind when you're deciding what organizations you'd like to tag in the post. Okay, it's like a little clue there. Okay, so let me know what those organizations are. OK, give me a highlight so I can see that that's your answer. OK, and then move on to the next question, uh, which is what are the actual at mentions you that would need to be used? So in this case, you want to tell me what the at mentions are at it's a heck, let's just say. Um, you know, if this was this is not an answer, but this is how you would show the answer for that question. And we want to look at the actual at mentions and to find those um, on your own. You'll just be able to go onto Facebook. And you'll want to search. You want to search search them out. So Mid State Technical College, let's say, for example, search them out. And here's the at mention. So you'll find that you'll find the page of the brand in the question that you want to tag and you'll just kind of copy and paste that and that's your answer right there if midstate was the one you would tag clearly midstate is the poster here so you're not necessarily tagging but we're looking for other other things to tag here in this okay and that's the final question there so again if you guys have questions you can 
shoot me a text or anything like that. Final thing I wanted to talk about today, if I can find it here in my tabs, here we go. All right, is, um, email assignment. So, um, so once I go into, uh, here's the things I wanted to talk about. All right. So marketing communications, sometimes, a lot of time, most of the time, some of the most important things to, uh, some of the most important communications you have in marketing uh, in the business world is email. And we talk about brands as like Midstate or McDonald's, or these are all different brands and companies, but, you know, every person now is their own brand so as you move through your career you want to make sure that you're writing messages to um, your co-workers your supervisor um you know if you're an instructor to your students um to vendors you want to make sure that everything you write to these individuals that you're interacting with um is in such a way that it helps your personal brand because you never know who is you're going to come across again later on in your career that you might need to you know get you out of a pickle if you lose a job or something like that or to give you a recommendation or um you know you want to make sure you have a really solid relationship with some of these vendors that you know if you're a little bit late on a project and you have like an emergency situation where you have to like get something printed out or you you know you have an emergency you want to you want to build a rapport make sure you have a solid enough brand so you can actually get people to do you favors and stuff in the future rather than be like oh that guy was a you know that guy was a piece of crap to me. Like, I'm never going to, I'm not going to help that guy ever. So, you know what I'm saying? So, um, so email is the most important marketing tool. I believe you have as an employee, um, or as a, as a worker, you know, uh, these, these days in marketing too. So, um, I don't only look at brands as like mid state and then I'm like separated from that. And, like, no, I represent mid state, like, I represent mid state individually. So, I, my personal brand is just as important as mid state's brand as well because I represent mid state. So, um, and I represent myself, and my, my personal brand is my personal brand. I'm Andrew Palios. I represent myself in a way that is professional via email or other social media platforms let's just say for instance um okay so so these are some of the things i wanted to be talking about a little bit and this kind of pertains to a little tiny little assignment that i have but marketing communication if you think about that concept um this becomes very important and a lot of people don't have very good email etiquette and so I wanted to make sure that I kind of covered this a little bit um, uh, too in this class to emphasize the importance of, of how this is a very important communications tool. So internal and external business emails, this is kind of like a cheat sheet that I put together for you for this lecture here. Um, subject lines. Um, what I, To do a subject line is just say exactly what the recipient should expect to uh, see in the subject line email. As I, as I look at my subject lines that I've sent in my emails to people today, um, whenever it's about a project, right? Here's here's an email I sent to um, a vendor. Um, this was today at two o'clock. Um, I put in the subject line exactly what this email is about, what they can expect. Mid-State Healthcare Simulation Center video. This is the only video that me and this me and this vendor have been working together on for the past three, probably three weeks. This is the only video I've worked with him on for, I mean, months. Uh, but we've been only talking about this healthcare simulation center video for weeks. I didn't I didn't put in the email subject line uh, mid state video or video. No, I put in Mid-State Healthcare Simulation Center video. I took the time to type all that out. Why? 
because if this guy need this guy first of all has a lot of things going on he's got a lot of clients that he's doing a lot of media placements for and, and we're one of his many clients so i want to make sure that it was very clear that this is the mid-state healthcare simulation center video and then i want to be vague and and, and stuff about it so now he sees me as someone who is very specific in what he says. He sees me as someone who um, takes the time and care to make sure I'm communicating very accurate and efficient and, and, and efficiently what he needs to know in the email subject line. And in the future, if he needs to go back and find an email from the past and he types out, um, Mid-State Healthcare Simulation Center or Healthcare Simulation Center or Simulation Center, he's going to come up to this email because I have the words Healthcare Simulation Center in that subject line. If I were to send him a, a thing that said Mid-State Video or just video, if this guy goes and types in Simulation Center or Healthcare Simulation Center, he's not going to even see this email because he's not going to be able to find it. This is this is a tactic that we all should start doing because search engine optimization, when someone goes onto Google and types in a word into Google, the only websites that are going to come up higher on that search list are the websites that have the verbiage that matches what is in that question. That's one of the that's one of the criteria for that piece of content to come up higher on the search, right? So if you're getting yourself used to this habit of being very clear and concise with your communication to these individuals, they're going to find it much easier to work with you, find it much easier to find the emails that you are sending to them from the past. They're going to love your brand. Your brand is going to be stronger, okay, in their eyes. If you think of if you think of the alignment between search engine optimization and how you write emails to people, they are very much aligned. They're very much aligned and very tightly knit together when it comes to branding and your personal brand. You rise to the top if you are an effective communicator. OK. So that's subject line. The two area, this is, um, there's a lot of the the differences between the two area, the carbon copy and the blind carbon copy areas in the email um, recipient area is there's confusion out there, you know, even even today. Um, so the two person is the primary individual responsible for replying to the email. OK, so there's a lot of emails that I get where it's to me, but then there's other people carbon copied the CC area in there, okay? The carbon copy area is for an individual that should be aware of the communication and be feel like they can join into the conversation. However, they don't necessarily have to. So sometimes, you know, I'll get a message and then my supervisor is carbon copied or another person on a different team is carbon copied. So they're made aware of that person messaging me and they can opt to follow up with that message or not. It's just kind of an FYI. That's what the carbon copy is all about. It's sort of an FYI. OK, but it doesn't mean that that person, that person that's carbon copied should you know, be included in any other kind of necessarily conversation back and forth in email, oh, nor should that person really feel like they have to respond either. It's always the two person that should feel like as though they have to respond to the email, okay? Blind carbon copy is, is just so another person could be aware, but no one knows that that person's on the email, okay? All right. So I just wanted to go and get that straight. We've gotten a lot of different messages and, and there's a little question in the assignment about this where, um, you know, people in our organization will email the entire organization um, and then and then a per, um, one person will reply back to that person, but then reply all to everyone else. 
So everyone in the organization of 100 people on the email list will get an email back from this one person responding to the original emailer, which then creates chaos in people's inboxes and stuff. So this is just kind of an email etiquette thing too. All again, if you understand a little bit of that email etiquette, your brand is a little bit stronger as a professional in, in marketing because again, like, you are representing an organ. We have a marketing team of four people. So anything, any organization that contacts MidState for marketing, it's one of four people. Any one of those four people could ruin the entire brand, uh, you know, MidState marketing brand by a terrible email, right? Or something like that. So it's a lot of like, it's a lot of stuff that you have to like keep in mind, uh, not only for yourself, but for your colleagues and things. Um, and more organizations are like that, you know, more people are doing, you know, more people are doing more with less, you know, organizations just are like that. So um, anyhow, uh, body copy for formal email. OK, so there's two types of email, right? There's the formal. These are the people that I've never worked with before. I used to have to email doctors and stuff in my past life uh, in my past life organization that never knew who I was and things like that. Why is this person emailing me? These doctors were cancer research doctors, so they were crazy stressed out, crazy busy. Like they had no time to hear from a communications manager that wanted to get a quote from them for, you know, a press release or stuff like this. So here's how I would address them. Dear Mr. Mrs. First and last name, doing the whole thing. Sometimes it's doctor. Uh, sometimes, you know, you know, things like that, you want to be super formal. You don't know these people. So that's how you address it. And then you go, I am regard, I am writing in regard to, and then you get right to it. So starting your email off by saying, I am writing in regard to, that gets, that gets right to it. You're telling, you know, they don't have to read anything else beyond why you're writing to them in the first place, et cetera. Um, I even do this to, I even do this to people within within the organization that I've worked with for a long time as well, as you can see in my casual version of the email. Um, and then so I sign off with um, all the very best to you or sincerely, first name, last name. Yeah, it's super simple, um, but the formality is just basically the Mr. and Mrs. and then the sincerely P's and then all that stuff. And then your first and last name, okay? Now, for the casual email, this is the email that I write to my colleagues uh, every day, and usually it's just more um, first name necessarily. I don't write the first and last name, but I usually just say like, hey, Sally, I'm writing to you. Uh, I'm writing in regard to and then the subject matter, and then I sign off with thanks, Sally, if there's only one or just use thanks with exclamation points if there's more than one. That's how I always sign off. I always say thanks your first name. Hi, your first name. Thanks, your first name. It's a little more personal and casual, and that's just kind of like my brand of email writing. And so it's consistent. It happens. It it happens all the time. I started doing the. I started using. Um. I I started saying thanks and by person's name with exclamation with an exclamation point at the end because the president of Quad Tech, uh, uh Quad Graphics, uh, used to write emails to all the employees that way he used to sign off on all the emails to people that way and it was super friendly and it was super like he was the president of like a three billion dollar company and he was addressing me by my first name at the end of an email with an exclamation point in a super friendly and personable way and it was like made him seem very approachable and like human and it was very casual, but very friendly, and it just it made me like him as a person. I don't know, I can't explain it, but that's just really that's just really why I do that because it made an impact on me, and I do that all the time to everyone else. Whether or not I feel like, whether or not I'm feeling depressed that day, or I'm having a tough morning, or nothing is ever working out for me that day, I always sign off my emails like that because. Um, as you'll see, as we talked a little bit more about the emails and stuff in this document, email is not about how you actually feel. It's about email, email messages and texting in general. It's about it's about how it seems. It's not like real, right? 
but you can seem one way in your text without actually being that way. Like I could be in a really good mood, but then I can write an email that comes across as like nasty or rude, but I wasn't intending it to be that way, but it seemed that way. Okay, so then you can do just the opposite. You can be in a really terrible mood and then write an email that seems happy and go lucky and very friendly. So you want to make it seem very friendly and happy and lighthearted and um, professional and consistent um, to help your brand, okay? So um, common uh, best practice things to think about when you're uh, doing email uh, conversations. Um, so a lot of times in emails with, um, with uh, you know, they're working on projects with other people in the teams as I'll at mention other people in the teams if I want them to respond to a question in email. So, um, you know, me writing email to the supervisor, um, you know, uh, uh, hey, you know, uh, hey, John, uh, thanks for your message. I didn't. Um, uh, I didn't see uh, um, I didn't see a notification there. Thanks for pointing that out. And then you can maybe call out your coworker to say uh, at at Sam at symbol Sam. Um, please let me know if there's any other messages that might be out there that need addressing or something like that, right? So you can at mention someone else that's maybe CC'd in the email or in the two um, recipient address. Um, if you'd like them to respond to something specific in the message that they're CC'd on and things like that. So the at mention first name within the body of the email um, when you're working, uh, when there's multiple people within the email string is a good way to then call someone out and and and, and ask a question in one, you know, uh, address multiple people in one email stream without having to send multiple emails, okay? Um, so I'll at mention people all the time. At mention so-and-so, can you uh, uh, respond with an answer to this question? At mention so-and-so, can you let me know when this due date is happening? At mention so-and-so, can you know? Um, can you check this copy to make sure I, uh, that everything is uh, according to brand standards and stuff like that? Um, one, the word one. Um, I commonly use the word one instead of using the word you in an email. Um, and then I go through some points about that. Um, uh, one is that, well, the example is, here's a message. You would think that multiple email channels would get better results in this campaign. Well, instead I would say one would think that multiple email channels would get better results in one campaign. You say you, people instantly, uh, in a very subtle way, get a little bit defensive from that word. Um, so in here, like people get defensive subtly and I try not to use that word. That's just maybe me. I do like to use the word I a lot because I have sort of um, positioning, um, uh, putting myself out there is bet it feels better for me than to than to say you to people all the time. Like you is kind of uh, could be um, interpretive, maybe like a little offensive or something like that. And it's And it's OK to say the word you, but I'm just saying like. Um, I try to like watch how I say it, and then if I have to say the word you, and it doesn't sound weird in the message, I'll say one. Like, oh, one would one would think that you know this is a good idea, or blah blah blah, stuff like that. So, so think about that. Um, that's one word. That's a word that I found that was a nice replacement for the word you. If you feel like um, using the word you might be like taken in in a, in a, in an odd way again. Email is about, um, and, and text messages in general is about how things seem and not like necessarily how they are. So if it seems like it could be taken, you know, in a way where you're like kind of pointing the finger at someone saying you, um, maybe one would be a word that works best. Um, in email also, um, I always um, uh, say I feel rather than I think, because I think me, you know, comes across as like, um, I'm unsure of myself. Um, so um, I always say I feel instead. So like, um, oh, I think I think this is the best solution for this um, graphic design where in, in other words, I say I feel this, you know, this graphic design solution is better this way. So, you know, feel I, I feel I think is a little more 
sure of yourself than saying I think in in the text written uh, area. Again, just a little nuances of branding things. I'd definitely be interested in hearing like what some of you all um, have to think and say and feel about um, you know uh, words and stuff that you use in emails too that could be effective. I'd love to maybe change change up some of my stuff too. Um, okay. Uh, pronouns. Uh, so you know, kind of be aware that those are a thing and people um, uh, are sensitive to that. So you want to um, make sure that you notice whether pronouns are being used in like the um, the sign off of the emails and you want to use those appropriately um, once you learn about those or once someone makes those pronouns aware to you. Um, you'll just want to do your best to make sure that you um, are respectful of those um, uh, uh, pronouns that are preferred by those that you work with. Again, to make sure that your brand is on point as a professional. Um, um, ah, my understanding. So yeah, um, let's see. Um, we get to that later. Okay, yeah, so I wanted to go to the biggest rules of email uh, communication. So no inflections available. So like you can't hear the inflection of someone's voice um, behind the email message. So I never assume that even if the email comes across as like cold, I would say like cold, if it sounds cold or short or things like that, I would never assume that it's like disrespectful or anything. Always, uh, always take every email, even if it's overtly nasty, like, like don't, don't take it don't like don't take it like personally or anything like that just be very um uh leave your sort of ego out of it um because i've had some of the best supervisors um the nicest people ones that have helped me out so much and provided so many good resources for me you know when i was looking for new work and stuff like that but their email style was just not as expressive and friendly and creative as mine and so um i always try to not take it personally because yeah they would have sometimes like some really short abrupt cold like emailing styles and it's like i just know that person is not like that so you know um i'm not going to take it in any such way so that's the disadvantage i think of emails is like you don't have the voice behind it the inflections at all so um just keep that in mind like don't um, don't let that get to you, I would say, um, because it could really drive you crazy. Um, another one is never send the angry email. Um, and then and then specifically, not everyone knows this, but when you get an email that's an angry email, there's a certain way to respond no matter what is said in the email. And this is a question in the assignment that I'm going to give. Um, no matter how nasty that email is that comes across you, and I have a super nasty example in the assignment, this is what you want to say. Um, I'd like to learn more about the situation um, and then say, let's meet to discuss the issue so I can get a better understanding. When would be a good time for you? And so probably early in my career, I got like this. I worked for a boss. And my boss was like super um, abusive in email. So um, I would get, I got this nasty email one time and it was like CCing a bunch of other people too, like other supervisors in different departments and things like that. And it was very like, you this, you that, blah, blah, blah. And instead of like responding and rebutting line by line to all these accusations that were made, all I literally said was, um, hi, so and so. I'd like to learn more about the situation, or I'd like to talk more about this. Um, let's meet up and discuss in person um, or via meeting. What would be a good time for you? And then, of course, I'd always sign off. Thanks. 
so and so exclamation point because you always got to keep it friendly so that's how it was and why does that work why does why does that work it's because people can be different people behind email than they can be in person no one's gonna no one's gonna get very confrontational with you in person because usually the person that is hiding behind the email with all this nasty stuff to say is more of a coward in person. So what you want to do is basically put them on the spot by saying, hey, let's talk about this in person. I'd like to understand the situation a little bit better so we can we can figure things out. What is a good time to work for? You know, what's a good time that's going to work for you? First of all, it's going to make you look like a real professional. Second of all, it's going to diffuse the situation because once you get face to face with this person, they're going to totally change their tune. They're not even going to be this crazy person because they could literally lose their job for um, at, uh, being a crazy in person. And it's just going to make you then get the results you want, which is to find a resolution to the situation so you can move on to other projects and things like that. So um, keep that in mind. Don't rebut this, that, and the other thing in the email message, just very simply stay. Um, and don't even say sorry. I say never apologize in an email. I would just say, I would just say, um, I'd like to learn more about um, how we could find a resolution please let me know what would be a great time to uh, speak with you in person. Um, this time's works for me or whatever, right? That's all you really have to say. <clears throat> um, and that's it. Uh, we did talk about the reply versus the reply all. So, um, you know, only reply all if all need to reply back. Um, emails to avoid, uh, the emails that just say thank you, um, all e reply all emails that say thank you. So if someone sends a message to the entire organization and then you reply back to the entire organization with something like a thank you, this is not a really good look. Uh, messages in all caps, not a good look. Messages that use excessive bold, not a new good, uh, not a good look. Um, if I want to call something out, I'll use italics which is like a softer way of making something stand out. That's a trick to use bold because you can't go without using bold. So italics is the way I use it. I never really use red or colors like that. I'm sensitive to color because I'm an art trained artist uh, from my past life. And then currently I do, you know, basically that. So that's something to keep in mind, the colors that you use. Um, a lot of people like to uh, please Please see my comments below in red when they have a, you know, they're answering questions in past email strings. Well, I'm the type of person that's like, please see my comments below in blue or green or something like that. So that's just how I think and work. And I don't know, I think it's, I, I don't know, it's just how I feel comfortable doing that. Uh, messages with excessive punctuation, underlines and sentences and things like that like underlining sentences and underscoring things it's just not a good look um and then response times you know not responding to emails right away it's okay um and then not checking your email first thing in the morning is okay when whenever i used to check my email in the morning i do that now i check my email first thing in the morning but um when i was more of like a production person a production artist person I wouldn't check my email till like 10 or something like that um, because I would just start cranking out work the first few hours. So depending on where you are in your career, like you don't necessarily have to check email first thing in the morning. If you're like more, you know, on the grunt, like doing a lot of like heavy lifting work. Right. And there's some days where that's like me, but then other days like, you know, today, for example, you know, I was checking my email first thing. So it just all the depends on what your workload looks like, et cetera. Okay, so keep that in mind here. Um, and then let's go into the assignment real quick. And then I will be done talking, I promise. Let's see, email assignment. So, okay. All right, so 
The first question is um, it gives you a subject line and then it's a two. So this is to all employees and then there's no one CC'd and the body says, good afternoon. We have a box that needs a ride from Wisconsin Rapids to Adams. So this is an example of um, a package that needs to go from one place to another. Um, and this is sent to all the employees of the organization to say, hey, can you help me out? Thanks. The question is, reply or reply all? You are one of these employees. Would you reply to this person directly or would you reply all to this email? Okay. Second one, respond to this email. This is the nasty email. How would you respond to it? Subject, marketing event brochure design. Events department, from the events department to John Sample. Okay, it's CCing the marketing department. And then this is the message, it's a nasty one. How would you respond to it? Based on the notes that we talked about, how would you respond to it, okay? It doesn't, and remember, it's not about line by line saying this, that, and the other thing and rebutting all of this stuff. This, you could just not even, you can just not even read. You know how to respond to it, okay? And how would you rewrite the email above? That's question three. So if, if you were to be the person that had to write this email in question two, how would you write that in a way that is more professional and true to your brand? That makes you look good and not makes you look like that, okay? And that's the assignment there. And so that's what I have for you guys. Uh, you have the places to turn in the assignments here on uh, Blackboard 2. So I just have a little note here. Please turn your assignment in there. And for Project 2, please turn your assignment in there. I will have this video uploaded. And uh, let me know if you all have questions.